Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, today, we've got a really important webinar on ocean acidification. Uh, if you don't know about ocean acidification, this group of people we're going to have presented are exactly the right people to talk to. The Global Ocean, uh, ocean Acidification Observing Network is an net international network of people around the world uh, and there's some scientific community looking at this problem. So, for much further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Jan Newton, Dr. Stephen Whittacombe, who are the co-chairs, and my colleague Duncan McIntosh, who is an expert and ex is a member of that organisation. I'll hand over to you, Duncan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so today we're just going to share a little bit about the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network uh, and a brief introduction uh, to the problem of ocean acidification. Uh, so our first speaker will be Professor Jan Newton, uh, one of the co-chairs of Goa On. So over to you, Jan. Thank you so much, Duncan. I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully you can see my first slide. Yes? Yes. Beautiful. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you um, about ocean acidification, the science, observation, and, and mitigation. And, and um, I'm at the University of Washington and um, and apart from also being a go on co chair, I, I look at ocean acidification both on a national and a, um, a local level. So today, um, what my goal in talking with you is to present the basics of ocean acidification science, to talk about go on's role, and then to talk a, a, a bit and queue up um, thoughts on, on mitigation and adaptation. So I am talking to you from this little blue dot right here in the middle um, there um, in the city of Seattle in the state of Washington in the United States. But I love this picture because it really frames up so much of what I think is important to, to bear in mind as we start talking about ocean acidification. First, you see the beautiful indigo blue color of the ocean. You see the green phytoplankton there. Um, you see the, the clouds, you see the land, but you also see that, that thin blue layer of the atmosphere. And it's really important to be considering all of these. So as we go forward, basic question, what is ocean acidification? And depending on how you wanna think about this, there's different levels you can delve into the complexities of ocean acidification. And so at the very basic level, just the way to remember it is that carbon dioxide from the air added to seawater from the atmosphere to the ocean changes the water chemistry. And just keep that in your mind. And if that's all you want to learn, that's 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 got it. But if you want to go farther, what's important to know is that how that water chemistry changes is it it does a few things. It reduces the pH of the water and it also reduces the carbonate levels in the ocean. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So here's another view graphic, and this one's really good because it, it um, not only shows the chemistry at the bottom of CO2 and water, creates carbonic acid, and then that dissociates right away to bicarbonate and, and a proton, and, and that can get really confusing quickly. So that's why I tried to, to really build this in blocks and, and make it, um, more conceptual at first, and then if you want the added complexity. But what this is showing is the, the CO2 emissions, and um, as those um, anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions have entered Earth's atmosphere, um, we all know that, that that increase in carbon dioxide is what has led to climate change or greenhouse um, gas effects, and, and, and increases in temperature, increases in extreme events, um, but not all of the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. Some of it is absorbed into the ocean, and that's about between a quarter and a third. So let's say 30% goes into the ocean. And in a, in a way, that's a good thing, because if it wasn't going into the ocean, then we would have more CO2 in the atmosphere. But the fact that it does go into the ocean enables this process of ocean acidification, the chemistry of which you see there, and, and here are those, those three effects. One is that there's more CO2 dissolved in the ocean, and that drives down the pH and down the carbonate ions. Okay, so um, why, 
Why is that important? Um, pH um, regulates the acidity and is really important for um, organisms. Carbonate ions are also important as building blocks for calcareous organisms. And we'll talk a bit more about this. All right, but first let's let's talk about the evidence. So here is a view graph from the IPCC and it starts like say in 1980 and goes to 2010. This black line right here is the atmospheric increase, the Keeling curve, as you know, the CO2, this was measured on Mauna Loa. It's measured all over the earth, but this is just showing that data series. Um, and, and we know that, that it, it, you know, bounces up and down with the seasons as there's, there's more uptake during, uptake of CO2 during summer and release during winter, but steady, steady increases. So that's the atmospheric signal. These colorful lines, the turquoise from Bermuda, the blue from Canary Islands, the gold from Hawaii, those are measurements, actual real measurements of seawater um, from the ocean. So these are the, these are um, seawater measurements of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the pH, and the carbonate ion. And you can see at all three of these monitoring sites that they have the same slope. So you have different ocean basins here, right? Bermuda, Canary Islands, and Hawaii, different parts on the world globe. They all have the same slope, and more interestingly, they have the same slope of the CO2 increase in the atmosphere for the pCO2 accumulation. And, and then we see the, the decline in pH and carbonate. So ocean acidification is a global condition. And the atmosphere, the world atmosphere is very well mixed. So the CO2 from anthropogenic combustion is in the atmosphere, it mixes much of it accumulates in the atmosphere, but about 30% accumulates into the ocean and drives these changes in seawater chemistry that you see here. Okay, so what's going to happen in the future? Now, this is the scary bit. Um, this view graphic shows now projecting into the future. So the, the, the change in pH and in um, carbonate and in CO2 um, through 2000 is based on real data, like I showed you. But the amount going out to the end of the century is based on model projections. And the problem with this is that the um, changes are, are, are going to accelerate with time. And it's just the way that the, the chemistry works. Um, pH is on a log scale, so even though it's a small amount in the in the number um, of, of pH from 8.2 to 8.1, that's on a log scale. So that's an actually a 30% increase in the acidity. Um, think of a 30% increase to your, your bank account or to, you know, your blood pressure. That's a big deal, okay? But at the end of the century, it's projected to be 100 to 150%. So these are changes that are um, important and changes that can be even more um, uh, profound with time. Okay, so this view shows the changes in pH since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So this is showing pH here, the, the blue to the sort of yellow scale in 1850 versus 2100 you can see there's um, a change in the ph that's forecast across the whole global ocean by the end of the century but that this is not homogenous there's there's hot spots that we see and this is due to oceanic processes such as upwelling of deep waters that have more co2 um, such as temperature regulation uh, and, and, and different chemistry that we don't have time to go into. But what's key is that there's, there's hot spots and, and that's something we need to think about as we think about how this is going to affect the planet. So thinking of the planet, let's think about the marine life, not just the chemistry. Everything we've been talking about so far has really been based on the, the carbon chemistry. 
So over on the left there, you see the changes in chemistry we've been talking about, an increase in CO2, a decrease in both the carbonate and the pH. What does that do to the biology? Well, as you might remember, photosynthesis is where photosynthetic organisms like algae or trees take up CO2 and um, convert that to um, carbohydrate and, and evolve oxygen, which is a wonderful thing for life on Earth and for feeding the food web. And so more CO2 could be an increase in photosynthesis. And we would think of this as generally, maybe that's a good thing. But as that photosynthetic carbon is, is produced and increased, um, eventually that organic material is gonna sink and it can create oxygen deficits at depth or it can just tip the balance of, of, of life. So, so not always an increase in photosynthesis would necessarily be a good thing. We have to think about the whole system. Um, the lack of carbonate is a decrease. It, this is shellfish calcification, but there's many calcifiers in the sea, coral reefs, um, um, tiny plankton called pteropods, um, oysters, crab. Uh, so many organisms are calcifiers. So the, the decrease in the availability of carbonate affects those organisms' ability to, to, um, to create their, their structures, their hard structures. And then pH is kind of a master variable. And um, um, pH changes in an organism can affect changes in physiology. And, you know, just think in a, in a human system when someone has an accumulation of CO2 in their blood. Um, and you might think, my father has COPD, so I, I know this really well personally, that if the um, human system gets a little out of whack, it can have a big um, metabolic change. Um, and we're finding that it's not just changes in pH that can affect um, organisms, but also... CO2 and ability of an organism to, to smell things or to sense their predators. So the biological effects are still being evaluated. There's many, but the other thing that this view graphic shows that, that as we think about marine life, we can't just think of ocean acidification effects alone. We also have to think about what we call, as scientists, we call multiple stressors. And I think we all intuitively know what multiple stressors mean. But here we're talking about the fact that, that the temperature is increasing and that the availability of oxygen is decreasing due to both that temperature increase and, and changes in the structure of the ocean. So a given organism may encounter not only stress from ocean acidification, but also from hypoxia and rising temperatures. So that all adds up. Um, and then there's regional stressors like, you know, things that humans do like overfish or pollute. Um, and so, so we have to be thinking about this holistically. And so then not only do we think about the, the system in terms of all the different effects that can um, cause bi biology to have impacts, but then think of it in terms of an ecosystem. And this is a beautiful um, view graphic here by Scott Doney and, and co-authors showing different ecosystems, coral reefs, pelagic food webs, um, seagrass meadows, and, and those changes there. And, and what we're seeing, if you look at the symbols, yes, you may see an increase in primary productivity, but you also might see an increase in harmful algal blooms. Um, you might see a um, change in overall calcification that affects the ability of the coral reef to exist and grow. And therefore that has um, um, implications to other organisms that depend on that coral reef. So it gets really complex um, quite quickly, but the um, overarching um, effects tend to be towards a reduction in biodiversity and a change in the, the situations um, where the, the biology of the, these ecosystems, which have evolved for millennia, a change to that. And the problem is, as you saw on that curve, that the changes that we're having are becoming increasingly rapid. And 
Natural systems adapt, but as the rate of change increases, their ability to adapt is, is compromised. Okay, so I think we've established that OA is a global condition, but it has very local effects. And so here now are, are pictures of different ecosystems, but also different human interactions in terms of, of um, the kinds of, of um, marine resources and, and marine ecosystems that are at play. There's a beach in the state of Washington, a reef in the Pacific, uh, um, another reef in the Caribbean and a, a sandy shoreline in New Zealand and the kinds of human interactions that are that are going on there. And so whether you're thinking about the health of the planet or the ability to grow shellfish, it's really important to be thinking both of the global condition as well as its local effects. And so um, we often say that ocean acidification is a global condition with local effects. And what we need to do is um, to understand both the local through the global scale observations in order to get either correct. We can't understand what's going on locally if we don't have that global context, but also we're not gonna be effective at giving a, a good worldview if all we're looking at is open ocean conditions. We need to understand these various vignettes of, of localized conditions to understand the, the, the condition worldwide. And so that really demands coordination, network skill, and, and open analysis. And that really comes down to people. And um, as I mentioned at the outset, I'm from Washington State and um, you may have heard about how the shellfish industry here spurred action um, in the early part of the 2000s or the mid part of the 2000s. And I love this picture because what you see here are a state governor, a tribal leader, a federal um, scientific organization, NOAA administrator, and a shellfish grower. And they're all talking together and exchanging information and coming together from their different perspectives, their different roles. And this led to legislation, governmental legislation to establish a Washington OA Center, to establish a Marine Resources Advisory Council with the um, um, task to keep the finger on the pulse of ocean acidification and how it affects the citizenry. So I just wanted to make the point that it's, it's people that can really make the difference. So ocean acidification impacts people who depend on marine resources for food, economy, culture, and health. And these changes, temperature and hypoxia, are also adding to the stress as the ecosystem and climate changes and um, ocean acidification. And so here you see a, a, an animation showing a, an ocean acidification variable, the aragonite saturation state. It, it's basically telling us how much of that carbonate ion is available. And you can see that it um, changes quite dramatically from the 1800s to the um, end of the century. And so in response, it's been really important to have observing systems, model forecasts and biological assessments that can inform coastal communities of ocean acidification status, its effects, projections and vulnerabilities. And that's where GoOn came in. Starting in 2012, um, the scientific community came together as a collaborative international partnership to to come together and document the status and progress of ocean acidification in a variety of environments, the open ocean, as well as coastal, estuarine and coral reef environments, to understand not just the chemistry, but also the, the biological impacts in terms of its effects on marine ecosystems and societies, and then to support forecasts of ocean acidification conditions. And um, so go on the Global OA Observing Network. Um, as it says here, a global prog problem needs a global effort. And so here shows you the nations that are currently involved in go on. We have 105 countries, but more than 900 scientists who are participating. 
And what's really exciting is um, that not only do we have this global expression, this global network, but we also have local efforts. A global problem needs local effort. And so we have regional hubs, eight of them, the Arctic, Africa, Northeast Atlantic, North America, Mediterranean, Pacific Islands, South America, and Southeast Asia. And these have all been grassroots started from the, the people there who said, hey, we want to connect as, a, um, as, as scientists studying ocean acidification and to better network and to connect with stakeholders, to connect with policymakers. And I want to um, draw your attention to these icon, uh, these logos over here in the left-hand corner. The um, um, the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, IAEA, and its Ocean um, Acidification International Coordination Center. Um, and I guess NOAA unfortunately got, got left off here, um, but also IOCCP, but, but NOAA, IAEA, and IOC UNESCO have been the, um, the entities that have provided the secretariat to um, provide the infrastructure to go on and, and its regional hubs. Okay, so these high level, there we go, got the right logo. Sorry about that. Um, well, it's good as an American that I left that one off. <laughs> um, so here are the high level goals, the three goals that I mentioned, um, improve our understanding of global OA conditions. Where is it happening? How fast and why? Um, to improve our understanding of ecosystem response. What are the biological responses specifically to OA? How fast are they happening? what ecosystems are most vulnerable and which are most resilient. And, and those are both really important to understand. And then also to understand how we can facilitate better projections of OA and its impacts through um, exchanging data, exchanging knowledge, um, model um, projections, and to really connect that with the kind of societally relevant forecasts that are, that are required. Okay, so when GoOn was formed, both in its requirements plan and its implementation plan, the people involved called for what kind of physical infrastructure? Do we need buoys? Do we need gliders? Do we need ships? Do we need etc.? And 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 how should those things be be assorted? Um, what kind of operations and maintenance support do we need? What do we need in terms of data, QA, QC? How can we best share analytical and synthesis activities? But the other thing that they really put forth is that we need the intellectual infrastructure for this to happen. And when Go On was formed in 2012, after one year, these were the nations and the number of scientists who were involved, 150 from 31 countries. And, and this is where we are today, over 900 from 105 countries. And so in order to do that, GoOn made a very concerted effort to build capacity. And so they've had a couple of different um, strategies. We've um, had a couple of different strategies. One is a program called Peer to Peer, where mentors and mentees are, are matched to exchange knowledge and foster collaborations. Some are direct assistance training workshops. Um, and uh, acknowledging not only the, the, the founding institutions, IOC, UNESCO, um, IAEA, and NOAA, but also the Ocean Foundation, who has really worked hard on these um, sensor kit provisions, we call it go on in a box, um, and, and worked to foster training workshops. So it's really this, um, direct emphasis that GoOn has had that has allowed that capacity to build. And um, I think what I've really hoped to convince you of is that we need the activity on local scales, but to be globally coordinated. But we can't have a global system if we don't have a global distribution. And so it's really important that we have that capacity building. All right, so here is a picture from our meeting in 2016 um, in Hobart. We had around 200 people at this. There was a meeting in China in 2019 
We had so many people that had to have a picture of it from the drone, but I love this picture because you see the faces instead of like all these tiny dots. And you can see that this is a, a collection of scientists who have a lot of diversity in, in gender, in, in um, origin, and uh, who've come together sharing their expertise to provide the world with scientifically valid OA status and biological response on global scales locally, excuse me, on local scales globally. And I think that the people involved in Go On are, are very much committed to uh, the science, but also to making sure that that science doesn't just stay in journals, but that it informs society. And that's been one of the real key successes also of Go On is to integrate OA information to policy. And that's happened, um, here's just some examples. A major one was the UN um, Sustainable Development Goal 14.3, um, which developed an indicator, 14.3.1, um, which is how to measure marine ocean acidity. And uh, Go On members assisted with the methodology of how to do this and are key in, in building out that data set. So that's a major contribution to the SDGs. You can see um, these other contributions to the World Meteorological Associate Organization, the Commonwealth Blue Charter. But then lastly, to the um, UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And Steve Whittacombe will talk to you more about GOAN's now endorsed program, um, um, Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability, or ORS. So with that, I'm going to turn to the last topic, which is to talk about mitigation of ocean acidification. So now you have an understanding of the OA science, the role of go on. And so, you know, a lot of you may be thinking like, well, what can we do about this? Um, certainly go on's role is to produce the data and to produce the, the input into indicators so that um, policymakers may have that information. But um, then where does it go from there in terms of, of mitigating OA? Well, um, <laughs> here, this isn't my area of expertise, but I wanted to queue up the discussion. The most important thing is that we limit CO2 emissions. Um, that is how you mitigate ocean acidification. Um, so thinking of green energy that, that will limit CO2 emissions. There are engineering approaches um, such as alkalinization, direct air capture, either putting stuff into the water or taking stuff out of the air. There are biological approaches, um, blue carbon protection and restoration of photosynthetic organisms that naturally take up CO2. And then in addition to mitigation, adaptation, strategies for resilience. Um, as I, as I looked into um, the, um, you know, some of these engineering approaches, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences produced a report just recently and said that the, um, the um, engineering approaches have not been fully investigated and therefore really need to be assessed in terms of whether they will have unanticipated consequences. Um, so, so I think at this point, this is an area where active research is needed. So with that, I'm going to um, stop and pass the baton over to you, Duncan. Uh, thanks so, uh, thanks much, so Jan. much, Jan. I'm just going, I'm just to, keep going to keep moving and, and we can we save, can save any, questions any questions until the end. Until the end. And so I'm trying to figure out how to unshare my screen. Here we go. There we go. Okay, great. Are you able to see my screen now? I'm going to go into presenter mode. Looks good. Okay, great. So I'm going to share a little bit about that local perspective that Jan mentioned, and this is going to be uh, from the Pacific Islands region. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work of the Pacific Islands Regional Hub of Goa On, and it's known as PI TOA. And 
one project in particular called the Pacific Partnership on Ocean Acidification. So the background of this work started at the third UN SIDS conference uh, held in Apia Samoa in 2014. And during this conference, the Pacific Islands identified a need for monitoring ocean acidification, for building capacity and resilience to ocean acidification, and to implement adapt adaptation strategies against ocean acidification. So New Zealand at that meeting stepped up and sponsored a $2 million project to do just that. And this project was managed as a collaborative effort between the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program, or SPREP, the University of the South Pacific, and the Secretariat of the Pacific Community. Um, as the project got underway, we also got some extra support from the government of the Principality of Monaco. Now, this project was designed with four focus areas. Uh, one was to support research and monitoring in the region. Two was to build capacity to better understand ocean acidification among Pacific Islanders and Pacific Island scientists. Uh, three was to implement practical adaptation strategies. And four was to support policy action in the region. So for the adaptation actions, we established pilot sites uh, in Fiji on the island of Tabayuni, in Kiribati, and three pilot sites in the nation of Tokelau. On the research focal area, um, some of what this project did was to start off by publishing a Pacific Islands OA vulnerability assessment. Uh, vulnerability assessment of pelagic fisheries to OA uh, that was published with the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. And then we partnered with the University of Newcastle in Australia to establish a PhD scholarship for Pacific Island scientists to study OA. And through this partnership, we uh, currently have a student from Papua New Guinea who's now researching coral restoration and coral resilience to OA at the pilot sites that I just mentioned. On the monitoring focal area, um, this is where the regional hub of Goaon was uh, very much active. And we partnered with the Ocean Foundation to distribute those Goa on in the box kits that Jan mentioned. And what those kits are is essentially a low cost entry point for monitoring ocean acidification. And they come complete with these handheld spectrophotometers that you see in the bottom right picture. And those don't go very deep, but they allow you to monitor in situ the coastal pH. Uh, and you can see one being deployed in the top right photo. And the kits also include uh, the necessary equipment to take water samples and the laboratory equipment to analyze those water samples to determine the other uh, chemical parameters that are necessary to understand the ocean acidification chemistry, uh, including total alkalinity and getting the PCO2 of the water. And you see that. So these kits were eventually distributed to over 14 scientists from eight, uh, I think up to now we have nine different Pacific Island nations. Uh, in addition to the Goa on in the box kits, we also partnered with the Korean Institute of Ocean Science and Technology to distribute and deploy a little fancier uh, observing buoys. And these are called moored autonomous PCO2 buoys or MAP CO2 buoys. And these are more expensive than the Goa on in the box kits but they're quite nice to have because once deployed, um, they don't require you to mess with them uh, for at least a year until they need recalibrating. So they're essentially autonomous and they can get a very nice time series of the parameters on ocean acidification. So we have deployed uh, MAP CO2 buoys as part of this project in Palau, uh, one in the Federated States of Micronesia on the island of Chuuk, and there's one in Samoa um, that was delayed in getting deployed due to COVID, but it's there and ready to go uh, as soon as uh, scientists can get back there to help with uh, deploying that buoy. 
on the capacity building and education focus area, um, we targeted uh, awareness raising at many different levels, uh, from village level to a uh, university level to um, the school children level. So one of the things we did was by publishing ocean acidification educational posters and then translating them into Pacific Island languages. Um, here you can see some examples in e Kiribati and in Fijian. We also translated these into uh, Solomon Islands Pidgin, uh, Ni Vanuatu, Tokelau and Samoan Tongan, uh, et cetera. On the adaptation focus area, um, we went with a bottom up uh, approach uh, that really started with iterative rounds of stakeholder consultations uh, with our three pilot sites so that the uh, community members could take a look at what adaptation actions are available and then decide which ones they wanted to see implemented in their coastal areas. So after numerous rounds of uh, adaptation uh, consultations, uh, during which we presented the different options, these were some of the options that were presented. So the first one is enhancing primary producers, uh, which can locally buffer the pH. So this would be, for example, um, conserving, planting, or restoring mangroves or seagrass, where they may be in the vicinity of calcifying organisms like shellfish or coral reefs. In the Pacific Islands, one of the main concerns when it comes to ocean acidification is how the coral reefs will be affected. So this adaptation option is really the only one that can directly address OA by locally buffering uh, pH by taking up some of the carbon dioxide that's absorbed in the water through the process of photosynthesis. These other adaptation options really consider OA as a stress multiplier, like Jan mentioned, uh, our, our marine ecosystems are really facing multiple threats and OA is just one that uh, multiplies with the others to give all of these organisms, including coral reefs, a difficult time. So whatever we can do to reduce overall stressors uh, can give these organisms like coral reefs a better chance at resilience. So one of those options is coral restoration, and this may be done to target uh, enhanced ground cover, enhanced biodiversity, or in some cases even targeting specific species which may be known to be resilient to uh, temperature or pH. Another adaptation option um, can be reducing reef stressors through management actions, uh, for example, establishing locally managed marine areas or LMMAs. So these often include uh, rotational closures, uh, conditional closures, uh, some cases permanent closures. And, and this type of a management plan is something that's well known in the Pacific Islands uh, and has been for millennia. So this, this is very well supported and enforced in Pacific Island villages. Another adaptation option to take pressure off of the reef can be reducing reef fishing pressure for those reef dependent communities by supporting alternative livelihood activities uh, so that they don't need to uh, fish the reef so heavily for protein. And for example, by supporting aquaculture, you can do that. And after these um, consultations with the communities and the three pilot sites, um, the island of Tavayuni in Fiji determined that they preferred to focus on mangrove restoration, developing an LMMA that encompassed multiple villages in Tavayuni, and developing alternative livelihood. And the uh, work partnered with the Fiji LMMA network with Conservation International and the Waka2 Foundation, which is an environmental education organization there in Fiji. In Tokelau, um, the nation that consists of three atolls, um, they wanted to work on all three atolls and they wanted to focus solely on coral restoration. So that's what we did. Uh, and we have coral restoration sites established on both the lagoon and the ocean side of Fakaofo, Nukunonu, and Atafu in Tokelau. 
And in Kiribati, um, they took a very comprehensive approach in that they wanted to establish a locally managed marine area that encompassed a little bit of everything. It, it has seagrass restoration, it has mangrove restoration, it has coral restoration on both the lagoon and the ocean side, um, and it even has some giant clam restocking. And finally, on the uh, policy support focal area, um, we've held numerous workshops with Pacific Island policy makers, um, educating and presenting different adaptation options. And um, one of the resources we've provided them with, uh, we've published a handbook uh, for Pacific Island policymakers specifically that describes different ways they can mainstream OA into their national policies. So I'm now uh, going to hand over to Dr. Stephen Whittacombe. Uh, and uh, at the end, then we'll take any questions. So I'm going to keep these slides up and just pass the mic over to you, Steve, see if I can mute myself. So the floor is yours, Steve. OK, thank you very much for that, Duncan. Um, so, yeah, what I would like to um, talk about for the few remaining minutes of the, the presentation is to is to think about what's going to happen in the future, not in terms of the ocean acidification impact, but in fact, what is it that the the global science community is looking to do to meet to rise to the challenge of, of, of ocean acidification? And it brings us back to what Jan mentioned earlier, the uh, UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which uh, many of you will be aware of. But in essence, that program, UN program, challenges us to define the science that we need or the, the, the planet needs for the future oceans that we want. Uh, and really that, that, that requests scientists to think a little bit differently about the science we do in the fact that it's very very easy for us to think about the outputs of the science, the, the cool studies we want to do, the experiments, the data we want to collect. But really we need to start thinking about the consequent well, why we are why we are collecting that and what we are trying to achieve. So within Goan we we took the opportunity to formulate a, a program and it's not a program um, that is probably similar to other research programs you might be aware of. It, this, this should be considered more like a roadmap um, for the science and a guidance for, for where we think the, uh, the, the ocean acidification scientific community should be focusing its efforts. And it, what is it we want to achieve? By the end of 10 years, where do we want to be that's in a much better place? So to do that, we focused less on outputs and more on outcomes. What is it we're trying to achieve as a community? And we defined these seven uh, ORS outcomes uh, that we would like to encourage not only the ocean acidification research community to engage with, but also partners uh, in government, in industry, in, in local stakeholders, because these outcomes are not things that can be delivered just by the scientists themselves. They have to be delivered by, by all of those of us who are um, who are dependent upon, who are integrated within the ocean and coastal system. So what are those outcomes? Well, at the end of 10 years, we hope to be able to identify the specific data and evidence that we need for the mitigation and adaptation strategies that we started to introduce. Duncan um, showed you some ex excellent examples of the kind of local adaptation and mitigation strategies that we want to see rolled out widely across, across the globe. We also want to have a global science community that is equipped to provide the high quality, high quantity and high resolution ocean acidification data that we need to take actions. And as Jan pointed out, whilst it's fine to be able to map ocean acidification changes at an ocean basin scale, these impacts are going to be happening incredibly locally. So it's really important that we, we empower those people who are looking to implement solutions to be able to do that on the data that is most relevant to the systems in which they are operating. It's important that we find ways to support long-term ocean observing systems, and, and by that I also mean coastal observing systems that are co-designed and implemented by the scientists, the funders, and the end user partners as well. It's, it's so common these days for monitoring 
to be underfunded and under supported um, because it's seen as routine observations where actually these data are critical not only in uh, determining what adaptation and mitigation and solutions we want to um, adopt but also to ensuring they are actually having the desired outcomes that we set out at the in the beginning when we design those 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 strategies we really need to understand the risks and severity of ocean acidification impacts on the marine organisms and, in, and ecosystems and particularly those that are uh, relevant to to human users we've seen a number of projections and that that again about uh, coast about the ocean scale changes, but we really need socially relevant pro uh, projections. We need to be able to project the likely impacts are going to happen in, in, in complex, highly dynamic coastal systems. We also want a public that is much more ocean acidification literate. We need, we need everyone to understand what the threats are, what the consequences are of ocean acidification, what the drivers are, and how best to, to um, employ solutions uh, that is relevant to, the, to, to their own situation. And we want countries and regions to routinely include measures to reduce ocean acidification in national legislation. It's all well and good recognizing the problem and collecting data to illustrate the problem, but unless um, governments and regions are prepared to take action, then there's little use in collecting those data. So Duncan, can I have the next slide, please? So what does OARS as a program need from governments, national bo uh, bodies and partners? Well, we need we need engagement. We need people to buy into the the outcomes that we've we've um, we've raised. And we also need people to to undertake the work on the ground that delivers those outcomes. But again, GOAN is a large network, 900 scientists from over 100 countries. But in essence, that that work is not going. Those outcomes are not going to be delivered unless we have buy-in from from those key stakeholders and partners that will help deliver the the um, the benefit, the ultimate benefits from the science that is done. We need those people who who fund research to provide the long-term support uh, for national and regional networks of monitoring and observing activities. And that will include investment in future R&D to enhance and increase ocean observing capability and data generation. In particular, data, um, data access. It's all well and good data being generated, but if it's not in the hands of people who want to use those data, um, then, then it might well as, as well have not been, been collected. So there's a lot of effort around ensuring open access of data and also data archiving systems that are easy to access, not only to put data in, but to pull data out. Capacity building and training, as Duncan um, out, outlined, is, is critical. We need to expand the community of people who are observing this problem. Traditionally, ocean acidification has been an issue that has been difficult to measure because of the complexity of the observing techniques. We need better, simpler ways of observing ocean acidification and empowering local communities to measure the ocean acidification on their doorstep. As I said, we need to increase the data availability and visibility for all stakeholders. But critically, we also need to effectively use the data and knowledge that it was generated to underpin policy decisions and legislation. And that's about ensuring that we get buy-in for, for local and regional and national governments to actually act on the data that's being provided. And that was a key outcome of the AWS program and working closely with partners who have expertise in, in, in working with uh, government in order to ensure that these things are, are uh, bear fruit in, in the future. So what have we done in terms of our outcomes? If, for each of our outcomes, we have identified co-leads and, and champions to push these, these areas forward. And we're also looking to call out to the, to the wider ocean community to get engaged in these things. And this isn't about us telling people what science to do, but it's us requesting that people consider the outcomes when they're designing the, the projects they wish to undertake and thinking about how the science they do or the capacity building or the, the, the governance activities they undertake can contribute to those outcomes and can move this whole field forward. 
So I end this presentation with a plea for everyone on the call to think about how your work that you do could possibly contribute to the successful delivery of the outcomes that we've 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 um, outlined today. And with that, I don't want to take up too much time because I'm I'm conscious you might be many questions. So I'm going to hand back to Duncan uh, to moderate some some questions any anyone might have. Thanks, Steve, and thank you, Jan. I'm switching back to team so I can check for questions and I'll stop sharing my screen uh, right now. Okay. I see a couple of hands up, so why don't we? I see um, Nick Lambert. Um, go ahead. I see your hand is up. Please, Nick. Thanks, thanks, Duncan, and uh, thank you, Steve and Jan, for. Um, fat, uh, I, I loved your presentation. Uh, it was it was clear. It was simple. It explains the problem, um, and the your curve is. I. I felt I probably should be more frightened than you made me feel. Am I right? I've, the more I listen to what you, you've all said, the more frightened I feel, but you didn't frighten me as much as I now feel. That's not being rude. Um, maybe you're just too gentle with me, but should we be frightened? Oh boy, Nick, um, that's a, a really good question. Um, I feel that, that we all should be frightened, but also frightened is a very powerful word because it can freeze people to take any action forward. And, and, and so I think that's the balancing act we're trying to, to make here is that um, I think it's really important to make people aware that these changes are coming and that these changes can have incredible implications and that they're really serious. Um, but yet that we can't just say like, well, we're, it's all gonna go to hell in a handbasket and we just can't do anything about it because that's paralysis. And um, I think that the more that we ha avail ourselves of, um, better information and find where those refugia are, find where the problems are, think about the kinds of um, adaptation strategies that, that Duncan outlined so well, think about how we can achieve those outcomes that, that Steve outlined from the ORS. That's, that's where I want to go. So yes, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> as someone who studies ocean acidification, it is very unnerving to me. Um, and is something to really be taken seriously, but also we can't freeze. So that's a great answer. I don't know if I may, may be, so, be so patronizing, that's a really great answer. Um, can I ask a supplementary, please, Duncan? That is to say, so, so sure. you, you all answered all my questions as you went through. I thought, oh, I've got a question. Oh, no, they answered that one. All the way through, you answered the question. So you, you've got a strategy, you've got a, um, a roadmap, you're engaging, you're engaging people but you talked largely about coastal communities. How do, how do we get this? How do we say this is going to um, give us some numbers? This is going to affect the global economy by X percent. It's going to reduce it, it's going to deteriorate it, whatever it is. How do we get the people inside the coasts in the mainlands to understand this? How do we make it the same profile as plastics? Is it more important? Is it more frightening than plastics? Um, if that's possible, you know, how, how do we get people to say, wow, I really understand that if I go on to green energy, then that has an immediate impact on ocean acidification and therefore I'm going to go and buy an EV. I, I, it's a very simplistic thing, but how do we get the general population, coastal communities, tend, people just think, oh, it's the coastal communities. It's not my bag. Do you want me to? I can jump in for a little bit. I mean, that's something we've we've um, we've talked about a lot within the Goan network is is engaging particularly with socioeconomists and understanding the the economic impacts of ocean acidification. And there's been a lot of work started around that area, but it's certainly something within ORS that we want to push forward. And in fact, we're reaching out to to different 
the different types of stakeholders to be co-champions of some of these outcomes and to develop exactly that kind of information to understand what the consequences are. Uh, as scientists, it's far too easy for us to, to, to finish at the, the biological or chemical consequences and say our work is done. However, the, the UN decade is challenging us to move much, much more rapidly out of that, that comfort zone. Um, I would say it is more worrying than plastics, um, but what plastics has as an advantage is it's incredibly visible. It's very easy to see plastics on the beaches. It's very difficult for most people to observe the dissolving of coral reefs or the collapse of a shell fisheries industry. Um, and it and we certainly need to be much better at that. And 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 it's it's a recognition that we need to engage with communicators who are who are experts in doing that. You know. Um, what, as you saw one of our outcomes, the, the idea of ocean literacy and ocean acidification literacy. And that's really an area we want to strengthen. We want to partner with those key people that can tell those stories and tell those messages. And I think, unfortunately, we are now approaching a time where real examples of ocean acidification led um, ecosystem collapse and economic local economic collapse is start, are starting to become apparent. So as tragic as that is, um, maybe that is empowering in terms of providing material to actually showcase to, to people. You know, the, 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 the scenes that, that, um, of bleached corals across the, the Great Barrier Reef was, 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 an, was, a, was a key point in getting people to understand the implications of temperature, you know, rising water temperatures. Um, Organisms crawling out of the sea because of hypoxic zones is critical in understanding. Ocean acidification impacts have been less obvious to people, but they are they are coming and they are starting to appear. And yes, we maybe we need to be more bullish and we need to we need to start start being a little more frank with people about what the consequences are. I don't know whether Jan, Jan wants to add anything. I think for the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to say that that I'll, I'll I'll save my comments. But I think you you hit it on the nail, Steve. Is that we we need to think about our communication strategy and 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 figuring out how we embrace more people, and that's what ORS is exactly situated to do. Thank you, Fab. Well, thanks all three of you. I'm going to ask uh, Noel Peters. Thanks for your patience. I see your hand is up. Please go ahead. That's okay. Thanks, and 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 thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, we're we're trying to find ways for uh, the private sector. I, I work in the private sector part of ADB, and we're trying to find ways um, to encourage the private sector to get involved in these areas, and and how they might be able to get some benefits from, for example, uh, blue blue carbon. Um, and and this might be too technical a, a question for this forum. Um, but perhaps you could point me in the right direction to know where the work being done on this is. But um, there's, an, there's, an, there's an issue of, of calcium carbonate cycling, um, which results in a short term net uh, positive CO2 emission, um, which apparently makes it very hard to claim carbon credits for blue carbon projects. And I wondered if you could if you could comment on that, if you're aware of the issue um, or if you know where work on that is um, is being undertaken. Thanks. I can jump in again. Uh, there's a, I mean, there's a huge amount of, of work currently on blue carbon habitats. Um, in fact, there was a very large blue carbon meeting after the COP26 meeting in Glasgow in, in December. Um, so I am aware that n the concept of blue carbon is not as straightforward as everyone. It's, you just restore some mangroves, some seagrasses, and everything's great. Not just through in terms of the CO, uh, the CO2, but also in other other green, potentially greenhouse gases such as methane and nitrous oxide. And we again, this this is back to to what Jan was saying about understanding what the the uh, unintended consequences of of of, um, of well-meaning, good-intentioned actions are likely to be. Um, over 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 time scales that are likely to be beneficial to ocean acidification, I would say blue carbon habitats are overwhelmingly a, a positive thing to be involved with. Yes, there may be some initial short term changes in in CO2 flux, uh, methane flux, nitrous oxide generation, but it is evident that the long term storage cap um, potential of 
of, of blue carbon habitats is incredibly benefit beneficial. But again, it's not a it's not a, a it's not a, a single golden bullet in the fact that the, the scope and the scale of blue carbon potential is is not big enough to, to solve the problem. So we need to ensure that we don't get sidetracked into one particular solution thinking it's going to be the the, the be all and end all. Um, the largest blue carbon uh, repository on the planet is is just mud and soft sediments in our oceans. Yet we we trawl the <laughs> we draw these these places to pieces, um, resuspending huge amounts of organic material and and reducing their capability of of, of storing uh, storing the carbon that we we the the, um, the system produces. So not just it's not just about restoring these sort of charismatic blue carbon habitats, but we need to protect some of the other carbon stores that we we treat so badly, such as the huge plains of, of, of muddy seabed that everyone thinks is completely useless and, and we can trash. It isn't. I also th th about, think about ways in which we can, um, we can store carbon from an engineering point of view, you know, carbon capture and storage. There's still huge potential in geological storage of carbon that we need to, and we need to explore. And I, I don't think there's anything at the moment that is preventing um, wide scale, industrial scale application of geological carbon storage other than a political will. Um, so I'm not sure whether that's answered your question. No, I don't. Um, but it's a great answer, but it didn't actually answer my question. Um, but perhaps maybe, maybe I could take this up with you, Duncan, um, after the, the, the meeting and um, we can explore this issue uh, further just in the interest of time. No, I'm sure. just going to add on that two things that I think Steve said that are really important, two words. One is system. And I think that anybody thinking about an engineering solution has to think of the entire system. And 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 oftentimes people are wor working on one aspect of the carbon cycle and not thinking about the other aspects of the system. The other word he said was scale. And I think that's really important to keep in mind too, because some of the, um, uh, um, mitigation efforts, let's say if it's blue carbon, can work on small scales and could make a difference to a very small scale um, issue, but cannot be a panacea for ocean acidification. So I think that that really keeping in mind system and scale is so important. So, and I don't have an answer for your question. <laughs> okay, but, but I, I completely agree with what you're saying. So look, look thanks anyway. Thanks yep. for the answers. But if you do want more information specifically on blue carbon, if you contact us directly, we can put you in touch with a host of people who are working in this area. OK, that, that, that might be useful because we're, we're just trying to find ways. You, you know, we're, we're investing in private sector and trying to get them more engaged. And of course, they're looking, you know, they're not looking at the whole system, to be really frank. Um, and and we're, 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 we're trying to find ways to make projects uh, bankable for them because they need to be bankable. And, and you know, carbon credits is one way to do that. Um, I, I completely take your point on it not being a systems approach, um, but it's it's a way to get private sector further engaged in this kind of work when they might be doing projects in, for example, the Pacific. So yeah, look, look, I would like to pursue that. So so thanks very much for the offer. And um, I've I've got to race off to another meeting. So so thanks everyone, and um, bye for now. Okay, thanks, Jan and Steve, uh, for taking those questions. I don't see any hands up at the moment. I don't see any questions in the chat, and we are just over three o'clock Manila time. So, uh, if that wraps it up, I will uh, hand back over to Steve Peters uh, to just say uh, the final closing. Over to you, Steve. Thanks a lot, Duncan. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate Jan and Steve also getting up uh, or staying up alternatively to present to us. Um, in our Mar STA, we're doing a lot of work at trying to find integrated solutions. And Nick was Nick is one of the is the senior economy lead on that. Um, we're trying to figure out ways that we can increase storage of uh, reduce carbon acidification and increase storage of carbon. That's the fundamental driver for it. Um, and we're using renewable energy, marine energy, as the entry point. But the the objective is to look at combating ocean acidification. So I hope we'll be a lot more engaged with all of you going forward. Um, I just have one question for you. 
the rate at which we're currently acidifying the ocean, how does that compare to the geological record from 66.5 million years ago? In terms of, are we the same rate? Are we less? Are we a bit more or are we a lot more? Maybe Jan, you want to answer that? Uh, I believe it's an order of magnitude more. So, Ten, uh, yeah. Ten times. Yeah. And, and that, that sort of wiped out a bit of, wiped out 97% of species on the earth. Well, mm -hmm. for the family of species. Okay, so it is a very, very big deal. We're not talking about insurance claims and losing property. We're talking about, you know, s significant issues. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. and I think um, I, I take your point about paralysis and getting people moving forward. So, um, in our conversations, we will temper our conversations as such to keep people focused and moving forward. That's a great piece of advice. So on that note, I'd like to thank you really a great deal for this presentation. This presentation will be made live on our data room. And um, we also are lucky enough to have Kirsten Isseni to talk with Nick uh, Lambert at the ADB Healthy Oceans Tech and uh, Finance Forum, which is the 26th to the 28th of January. Um, so on that note, thank you very much. And we're very happy to have you in the team, Duncan. So thanks, mate. Thanks a lot, Steve. No, bye everybody. Thank you very much. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank pleasure. you. Thank you.